I'm Clint, and we're going to be talking about the issue of references on this episode of Swatches. This video is really a response to a correspondence that I received from another artist who had some questions and concerns about using references. I'll start by just reading from that correspondence, then we'll talk about the issues one by one. I'm doing lots of art studies lately, figure drawing, photo studies, and such, but every time when I'm trying to do something from imagination, it feels like I never did those studies. I still do the same mistakes, and most of the time it feels like I cannot work without a reference. Do you have any advice to overcome this problem? Is this even normal? It depresses me, kind of, and I feel like I will never reach my goal I set for art. Is it normal? Absolutely it's normal. Uh, I've certainly been there myself. Uh, and does it get better? Yeah, it does get better. Slowly. It takes time, it takes practice, but I know what you're going through. Uh, I, like many of you other artists out there, I've spent hours copying drawings out of master's books. Uh, I remember I've got a slew of drawings that I did from Bridgman's Guide to Drawing from Life. But yet, when I start to go back to drawing my own stuff, I, my characters feel flat, they feel contorted, they just feel stiff. And what's the problem going on here? What issues are involved with this? Because you do the study, but then it feels like it doesn't pay off. One issue going on is that people have bad visual memories. Say I did a hundred drawings out of Bridgman's book, copying it down from his anatomical studies. I am probably going to forget 90 or 95 of those out of the hundred. Only five of them are going to be really any use or going to stick in there somewhere to be used later. People just have a low retention of visual information. There are some people out there with eidetic memories uh, that have almost perfect recollection of things that they see. You know, I'm not one of those, and most of you aren't either. But in this case, think of references. If you're going to use a reference for an image, that's fine. There's no problem. If you need it, use it. References to an artist are the same thing as a cook using a recipe. Now, is it cheating for a cook to use a recipe? Well, not at all. And it's certainly not cheating if they're making something that they haven't made before. I have never made a souffle. Should I feel bad for having to use a recipe to guide me through making a souffle? Well, no. Nobody would think that would be cheating of me. Nobody would think that would be low of me to need that. Now, I don't need a recipe in order to make a bowl of cereal. It's pretty simple. Bowl, spoon, cereal, milk. But that's a very simple recipe, and it's one that I memorized when I was a little kid. Now, in the same way, there are some things in drawings that you don't need a reference to go through. You want to do a happy face? Two dots and a little curved line at the bottom. You don't need a guideline for that. But if maybe you don't draw animals much and you need to draw a horse rearing up on its back legs with a knight on its back. Um, yeah, you probably need a reference for that. That's not something that is easily memorized, the mechanics of what's going on there. So, he's saying, does it get better in his question? Yes, it does get better in the same way that the more times that you cook a certain recipe, the less that you actually need to reference the recipe itself. You remember the elements that go in to that piece, okay? And also remember that recipes to a cook are just a guideline. It's if you follow these steps, you're gonna end up with this result. But he doesn't have to be a slave to that, or she. It is just a guideline. So say that I'm making blackberry cobbler. My mom's got this blackberry cobbler that recipe that's really good. However, I like a bit more crust in my blackberry cobbler. And I like a touch more cinnamon. Now, I just use that as a guideline. I said, okay, well, this will get me pretty close to where I want to go, but it's not exactly what I'm going for. So let me modify it. 
And artists need to be the same way with the references. Say, so, yeah, that's got some elements that I really like, but I don't want it to come out exactly like that, so I need to modify it. So, you know, the legs and the torso look good, but the arms in that reference photo just don't work for me. Fine, make up your own arms. So use what's useful out of it for as long as it gets you where you need to go. Now, there was also some tips about using reference. If you're going to be using references, and if you're going to be copying um, drawings out from photos or from art books, I have some tips a bit later on that. But let's talk about another issue going on here, and that is one of understanding. I can write a sentence in Japanese if I'm looking at a page that has Japanese writing on it. But I cannot write an original sentence in Japanese. Why is that? It deals with understanding. If I'm writing a sentence in Japanese and I can look at Japanese writing, all I need do is copy the visual appearance of the characters themselves. A line here, a line there, a 90 degree line here, a dash here. I'm just copying the visual appearance. In order to write an original sentence in Japanese, that would require me actually understanding the language itself, which I do not. And the artist can do the same thing. I can spend hours copying drawings out of Bridgman's Guide to Drawing from Life or whatever other source material I might be using. But that doesn't mean that I'm understanding what I'm drawing. I know that, say I did a hundred of those drawings, I know that most of those, my mind had just flipped to copy mode. I was just copying down what I saw. Line, line, shade, line. I just turned myself into a human copy machine using a pencil. I could have done the same thing with a real copy machine and done it faster for as much worth as I actually took out of it. So you see what I'm saying? He chose those lines and those forms in his original drawings for a reason. He was looking at the actual model. Now, I needed to understand why he chose those forms and those shapes and those lines. I didn't need to just copy them. And there's a big difference there. See, I'm just copying the two-dimensional drawing. However, what is really beneficial if I can understand the three-dimensional forms behind it. If you can understand the forms, that is the 3D shapes, that those shapes are based on, the two-dimensional shapes are based on, then you can move those 3D shapes in your mind and arrange them into a new position and have your own drawing. Whereas, if you're just worrying about the two-dimensional copying of it, then you can't translate that later. You can't twist those 2D shapes in your mind to come up with anything else original. Now, drawing from life is better. If you can draw from an actual 3D model, uh, be it a, a still life, be it a human figure, be it a tree if you're going outside, that will be better and be more useful than drawing from a photograph because your subject will be 3D and you will be forced to understand and observe the 3D nature, the depth of it, so that when you draw it again, you'll have a bit more mental image, a bit more mental retention of what the form is. And if, like I said, if you understand the form, then you can rotate that form in your mind to a new position to use later. And it's just harder to do from the 3D because you, uh, from the, a 2D image, because you never saw the depth of it to begin with. You never saw the 3D original. Now, if you're doing your studies, let me give you a couple of tips and suggestions on how you might make those a little more beneficial instead of just getting into the routine of copying what something looks like. Say that you're drawing people, okay? Instead of just copying down images, I don't know, maybe from a catalog or magazine or something, 
get those same images that you'd be copying from and don't draw the person standing there. Now, something you can do is maybe get a, a clothing catalog, right? And have, uh, you know, the people just standing around showing off the jackets or whatever. Don't draw them as you see them. Draw the form and the frame of the person underneath. Sketch out a simple skeleton of how they're standing. That way, it forces your brain to look past the veneer, the two-dimensional veneer of what you're seeing to understand the three-dimensional form of what's actually happening underneath. Okay? So, a simple block head, no details, right? Simple sort of oval for the chest. A couple of lines for the arms and the legs. And then you will begin to recognize the skeleton, the pose, the frame, the weight of the person standing. That will be more beneficial. Or maybe you want to work with the skeletal system. Again, don't draw you know, the jacket or the blouse on the outside. Don't draw the hair falling down. No, just look at the under structure and draw that, even though you can't actually see it. It'll make your brain think, and it'll make your brain actually observe what you're seeing. And when you do that, you will begin to be able to use that information and that understanding in your own characters. Now, there is benefit in copying something exactly as you see. Now, let's, let's be clear about that. There is benefit in doing that, but you need to set out with that being the goal. You say, right now, I want to practice how exactly accurate I can make a copy to that original. Because that will force you to really, really look at your subject. It will force you to be able to Throw away all these preconceptions that you have in your mind about what you think it should look like and really look at it. Now, I remember when I was a teen, I got into doing trompe l'oeil drawings. Now, that's, a, I believe, a French term. Forgive me if I'm wrong there. But it deals with the fooling the eye. It's an illusion about drawing or painting something so that it fools the viewer into them thinking that it was real. Now, example of one that I did was I got a sheet of piano music, I believe it was, and a post-it note or something else like that, and I drew them on a large sheet of paper so that when you looked at the sheet of paper, it looked like there was a sheet of piano music lying on that paper. Now, I did it convincing enough that I actually had a friend over and they thought there was another piece of paper laying on it. Now, that practice is very laborious, but it was very good for making me really focus on what I was seeing so that I could, as accurately as I could, 100% copy exactly what I was seeing. Now, you can do that, and that is beneficial, but make sure that is your goal before you set out Otherwise, you're just going to be waffling through your studies and not getting much out of it. Now, obviously, being able to draw people realistically, being able to do uh, believable poses isn't the only thing to make your piece look real. Now, the same thing goes with lighting, for instance, so that when you're doing your drawings, pay attention to how the lighting works in that image. One light source, two, three, bounce lights. Um, is there, uh, what kind of shadows is there? Where are the occlusion shadows? Where is this, that? If you can begin to observe where those things are, how they behave, and why they behave that way, you will be able to use those again in your drawings. And you'll be able to understand that, okay, if I'm putting my character in this situation, and there is a light right here, how is this object going to be shadowed? 
And where will the bounce light be from? And where will my specular lights be? On what kind of surface? Paying attention along the way at your studies of how the lighting works and behaves, you will be able to under, start understanding the principles that it follows. And once you understand the principles, you can rearrange the situation and those principles are always going to be holding the same. And you will be able to apply those principles in reverse to your own images. In this case, those principles become recipes, essentially, going back to another analogy. In this case, those principles become the recipe cards from our earlier analogy. Or if you want to think about it, they become files in our filing cabinet, our mental one. So that later on we can go, oh, you know what, I did a drawing last year or I did a painting last year of a, you know, a cheetah running across a prairie. And I remember under that lighting condition, this or that happened. So that the more principles and the more forms and memories that you can build into your mental filing cabinet, the more recipe cards that you can put in your Rolodex, the more you'll be able to draw from and the less that you will actually need references. Now, the need for references will vary from artist to artist depending on what kind of work they're doing. Now, concept artists and some illustrators will need to have a lot more mental files and a lot more recipes in their set in order to do their work. For instance, a concept artist might be given the task of Illustrating a scene where a four-winged dragon attacks a castle made of crystal. Now, you can't just rush out and take a snap photo reference of that. Now, a traditional artist, say he wants to do a plein air painting of a barn. Well, you just go out and you set up your tripod in front of a barn and you paint the barn. But a concept artist doesn't get to do that because a lot of his subjects don't even exist. Therefore, he must have a lot of mental files of the pieces that he can put together in order to make that scene. Therefore, a lot of concept artists say that they worked without reference. Yeah, because you have to. Uh, there is not a, uh, a primary reference that you can work from, but that doesn't mean that they did not have uh, references that they learned from along the way for all the pieces that are in that image. In order to build up your mental library, one uh, practice that I might suggest is picking a subject that you want to remember better. Uh, for instance, say that you want to know uh, more about how to draw clothing, wardrobe styles, uh, and so, say we pick Vikings, okay? So you go get a historical book that has images of the way uh, Vikings dressed at the time, their kind of armor at the time, uh, the clothes they wore, and then draw those. And then identify which three characteristics of that clothing you want to remember as being iconic to that Viking wardrobe then try to memorize that because the next day come back and draw that again without looking at your previous drawings or the references. Now you might forget the rest of the image but make sure you remember those three things that are iconic to making a Viking look like a Viking. If you do that the next day and possibly the next week then that will be more firmly embedded in that mental library. That will be a recipe card that you won't need to look at again. Now, that will also help because it's more in your long-term memory. You can pull it out and use it later. So you're drawing a uh, barbarian character later on. Then you can say, well, you remember uh, in Vikings, they had a such and such garb. 
that look kind of neat. Now, I don't want to copy that exactly, but I want to use one of those three elements that I remember about Vikings and add it to my Barbarian. That way, it will lend a, a touch of authenticity and will be something relatable to the viewer because the viewer will be familiar with Vikings and they will see that and they'll recognize it. It won't be exactly a Viking, but it will be believable because they've seen that in history or something like it. Now, of course, you don't have to be limited just to in Vikings. I would suggest if you want to make this a practice and you have time to have part, make this part of your art studies, then pick a, pick a variety of subjects. For, I would certainly say for characters, I would say wardrobe and armor styles uh, throughout the ages. I mean, you've got everything from... Now, ancient uh, Egyptians, and you have uh, Asian cultures, you have European armors, you have, you know, modern military, you have just everyday clothes. Uh, but aside from characters, think about studying some things that's like architecture. Memorize what makes, you know, 18th century European architecture what it looks like. Um, remember a couple of things about how to draw a cathedral. If you need to draw a cathedral and you don't have reference, cathedral is nice. Consider learning some about nature, uh, different kinds of trees, different kinds of plants. So pick a couple of elements. What makes this vehicle look good? What makes a tank look like a tank? Memorize a couple of key points from that so that you can incorporate it into later designs. One final thought is, I see some people out there drawing without reference who really shouldn't be doing that. I would really advise them not to, and this is my reason. Say that you're not good at drawing horses, and you keep drawing horses. Well, that means that you're drawing them inaccurately time and time again. You are ingraining the habit of drawing things wrong. Well that will make it even more difficult to see that it's wrong in the future. Now, I've seen that. I, I'm speaking from personal experience. There are some things that I keep drawing wrong, and I'm starting to see that now. But I've done it that way for so long, I've got a blind spot. Repeatedly drawing something wrong over time will make a blind spot in your drawing. So I'd advise you, if you don't really know how to draw something accurately without that reference, get the reference, okay? Otherwise, in the long term, it's probably going to be detrimental to your style, to your art quality in general. And with that, I want to just want to thank you for taking time to watch this video. I really hope it's been beneficial to you. And if it has been, give me a thumbs up and please consider subscribing to the channel for future videos. I am open to hearing what your questions on art is, uh, if there's some feedback I can give you, or topics you want me to cover in our next video. Please comment below, I will check those out, and until I see you next time, keep drawing.